If there's one thing that we know about the Apostle Paul is that the Apostle Paul was an amazing minister. And we've been exposed to that in our continued study in the book of Acts. And even from what we've seen last week when we got started looking at Acts chapter 26, um, as he as he starts to uh, make his defense slash testimony slash gospel presentation to King Agrippa. As what we started to look at last week, we're going to look at it again. We're going to continue by looking at it this week by finishing up chapter 26 and just seeing uh, just how the Lord was able to use Paul in that particular instance um, to be able to present things to Agrippa and to everybody else around him. Um, regarding his own testimony, the fact that Jesus Christ is alive and what that means as far as the resurrection and how that's supposed to speak to people today or even in his day. Um, so I want us to take note of those things. I want us to internalize them. Um, we can use some of these things as examples uh, in our own lives, just seeing how Paul dealt with different people, um, how he reached out to different people. And again, we get a good look at Paul's spirit and his motivation. What motivated him the most? We've talked about this before in times past in that even even in these in these times in these last several chapters that we've been looking at in the book of acts even though he is not a free man anymore we see a guy who is still preoccupied with making the name of jesus christ known while he's still in captivity okay that is the mindset of a man who is passionate about christ and passionate about his gospel and so i think it's truly amazing we're going to take a, a look uh continue to look um at paul as he stands before king agrippa as we finish up acts ch acts chapter 26 i think we're in, some, in for some good things i hope you stay with us my name is steve gill and you're listening to loving the scriptures Before we delve in here, I want to I want to bring up something that that's not related to anything that we're going to be talking about here um, in this episode. It was it's interesting. Um, earlier today, I was uh, I I stumbled upon um, a Bible quiz online, an online Bible quiz. Um, you know, and it had the whole thing: test your knowledge of um, of the Bible. Um, and it, you click on it in the in a you, it's take it takes you to a page with a little bit of a short article uh, that was saying many people who say that they're Christians, you know, it's surprising that a lot of them uh, don't have a, a good knowledge of, of scripture and everything and test your own knowledge, see how much you know about scripture and everything like that. And so um, I went ahead and I, and I took the, took this quiz. It was, uh, I think it was 75 questions. If I remember correctly, I think that's how many it was uh, 75 uh, questions. Um, I got them all right. I don't say that to brag, but I just say that because I know that you're wondering, well, what did you get? Okay. So that's, <laughs> uh, I, I did, I, I did get all the, uh, all the answers, right. But that's not the point. It, the, what was interesting was the very last question on that quiz. Um, and I'm going to, and I'm going to, uh, call out to uh, those of you who have been listening for a long time and have been with us uh, in the study of the book of Acts well into the well from the beginning and I you know just think in your own mind if you can if you can uh, if you can figure out what I'm what I'm getting at here um, the last question and by the way the way that the the questions were set up uh, there would be a question it was multiple choice but it was it was it wasn't your standable standard uh, multiple choice usually with multiple choice you have at least four options um, these questions you only had two options you choose one or the other so you had a 50 50 shot if you weren't sure um, and um, you know so the very last question of the quiz asked which of the following was not, and I think they had not in in all caps, just so you're aware of what they're asking, which which of the following is not a prophet? And the two choices that were given given was Isaiah and David. And I read that question and I'm like, uh, oh, that's a bad question. Um that's a bad question because well let me well, let me tell you what I did. I mean I answered the question in the way that I felt that they what the answer that they were looking for um which is david david was it where it says which one of these was not a prophet obviously we know that that isaiah is a prophet uh but the the people who, who put together the question would say that david was not a prophet now of course 
anybody, even in the secular world, who has some sort of knowledge of, of David, and even especially within the Christian community, they think of David, they automatically think second king of Israel, which obviously is true. But what a lot of people overlook, and I, and I think, I believe we went over this way, 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 way back. And I say way, way, way back because this was all the way back in chapter two of the book of Acts. And this is in uh, Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Notice what Peter says about David. Uh, he says, and in, in, I'm looking at Acts chapter two, verses uh, 29 uh, through 31, looks like here. Where it says, brothers, I, I, may say to, uh, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Now listen, verse 30, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with, him, sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So there you go. That's why you see that, that, is a, that the last question really wasn't a good question. The question would have been a better question if they had put another option in there other than other than David. Now, of course, I, I don't think a lot of people would really think about that. They would, and they automatically know that they they would pick David. But they would pick it with the thought of David wasn't a prophet; he was a king. And actually, yes, he was a king. That's what he's best known for. But according to Scripture, uh, David actually Peter actually identifies David as a prophet. So. I would be one who would look at that question. And I did look at that question. I say, eh, well, you know, that question isn't altogether accurate because they're looking for um, that. They're expecting the right answer to be David uh, when, in fact, David actually was a, a prophet. But anyway, I don't know. I just I just found that uh, found that kind of interesting. But uh, in, in case you didn't know that or you don't remember that or whatever, just kind of put that as a as a notch underneath your belt in case uh um in case uh you come up on some bible trivia and somebody tries to trick you or something like that um maybe you can put that to good use or you know whoever's asking the question will have the same expectations as whoever wrote the quiz on this on this online thing and you can correct them and you can say well actually scripture does say that david was a prophet and he certainly was so anyway I just thought I'd share that before we get started. It's not relevant to anything that we have to talk about today. What we do want to talk about today is uh, Acts chapter 26. And like I said before, at the beginning, we're going to finish up that chapter today. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lay this out now uh, in case I forget to uh, at the end of the at the end of uh, today's uh, podcast, Um, because I said and I think when uh, when we started up in chapter 22, I said one of the things that I think what I'm going to do is from that point all the way to the end of the book of Acts, go through the whole book of Acts, however many episodes it takes until we finish up, um, until we finish up the book of Acts. Um, and if there is going to be a break, if I do decide to take a break, it will probably be after chapter 25 or something like that. Well, I've come to a decision where I think I want to take one more break from the book of Acts. Um, this one being a chapter later than what I had anticipated before um, when I said that, you know, if we take a break, it'll be after chapter 25 or whatever. Um, and I want to take a, a, an episode or two um, to, you know, to step away from the book of Acts for a little bit one more time uh, before delving back in and then finishing up the book. And the reason why I want to do that is that um, for much of what we've been through in, in Acts so far, we, we've been we've been we've been going through some some good things, but one of the things that that we have to realize, and I've mentioned this before, I believe, um, in past episodes, is that we're dealing with kind of a a stretched out narrative where you know every time we leave a particular spot um, at the end of a podcast episode after looking after a, a specific passage, we're we're we haven't reached any sort of resolution yet, and you know while. While there are certainly things that we can gain and glean uh, from these different episodes that we've been going through, and just as we've been working our way ever so ever so slightly to the end of the book of Acts, even though there's things that we can that we can grab from, I think that there's the challenge is 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 grabbing on to grabbing on and hooking on to things that are that are uh, that are I don't know what the right 
term to use is I'm going to, I'm going to invent my own term. I'm going to call it intensely solid. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a challenge to grab onto something intensely solid when we're dealing with a long stretched out narrative, like we are right now in this section of the book of Acts. And when we finish up chapter 26, we're going to be going into chapter 27, where that challenge is going to be, is going to be extended a little bit more into a higher degree. Um, because we're going to go over, uh, Paul's adventure as he crosses the Mediterranean Sea on to Rome. Um, and, um, the, the whole thing of, of the, uh, astonishing tale of the sea, if you want to call it that, um, that he and everybody else on that ship, um, experienced the storms, the, and, and everything like that. And there are a lot of nautical things that are going on and everything. And so, um, again, it's going to be a continuation of that thing of, of this whole stretched out narrative where we, where we grab onto some things, but perhaps not, uh, we don't grab onto things that are intensely solid. Um, and so I want to I want to step back before we get into chapter 27 to talk about some other things that, you know, just to kind of anchor our hearts and our minds um, onto things that we can that we can grab onto intensely um, and solid, solidly. Um, and so I, for that reason, that's what I want That's, that's why I want to take this break and I want to take it here. Now, again, I'm, this isn't say, again, this isn't to say that there's, there isn't going to be anything that we can, that we can learn or glean, uh, from chapter 27 or that we haven't been learning or gleaning anything from the previous chapter since chapter 22. Again, that's not what I'm saying, but it's, it's, you know, gleaning certain things here and there as we as we as we study this long uh um narrative having to do with Paul and in his captivity in this last section of the book of acts looking at that versus just kind of grabbing onto something that is uh that is more solid i guess and so what i think i'm going to do uh next week it's i want to talk about um restoring restoring a brother or sister in Christ uh, and what I mean by that is specifically um, you know a, a brother or sister in Christ who is in sin um, it's a very challenging thing to uh, you know to, to really consider because it's uh, I think for a lot of people it's a very intimidating um, situation to approach um, but it's something that we have to know about. It's something that we have to delve into Scripture and see what, what does Scripture say? What does Jesus specifically say? Because we're actually going to look at a passage that looks at that specifically, where Jesus talks about this. Um, and we're going to and we're going to uh, glean some very important things uh, from the words of, of Christ. Just to give it away, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 18. Um, and after that, we're going to continue with uh, with chapter 18 um, and looking at the whole thing of forgiveness and, ask, and answer, answering the question, why should I forgive? And it's all connected together to uh, in you know what Jesus is uh, um, what Jesus says there about restoring a restoring a brother or a sister. Um, so I you know I think I think we're in for some good things just as it relates to that. So I would encourage you to come back next time, um, the next couple of times, and you know just really settle in, settle your hearts and your minds into to listening to the words of Jesus and and getting some things um, out of this um, that are I'm going to say vitally important for Christians individually and even for our churches. Okay. Um, you know, so come back for that. I, I, I implore you. Um, and I think that, uh, um, that it will be profitable for you when we go over, um, those things. So that, and then after, after that second break, uh, after that second episode, when we take a break, we'll get, we'll get back into acts. And I anticipate that from then on out, we'll, we'll cover chapter 27 and 28, um, and, and go and, and finish up the book of acts. Okay. So that is the plan going forward. And so let's uh, let's pick up where we where we left off here. Um, and just to, again, as always, it's it's good to just kind of um, remind ourselves of where we are and, and what's going on uh, where we left off last time. Um, like I said before, we started chapter twenty six last time. Um, and chapter twenty six is uh, Paul uh, Paul's presentation uh, before uh, King Agrippa the second. And we've already talked about who he was and just, you know, how he's, uh, uh, him and, uh, Bernice actually, which again, that's not his wife, but, uh, his sister, but 
historically we know that there there was probably some incestuous things going on there um, and all of that stuff. But we know, what we learn about Agrippa is that he's religiously he is a he is a Jew, and Paul is going to use that. We're actually going to see this today. He uses that to his advantage um, as he tries to present the gospel. Uh, to uh, to the king here, and which, by the way, I want to. I just let me just say this. I think it's pretty amazing, um, you know, just the circumstances uh, that unfold to give Paul the opportunity to speak in front of these these government officials, uh, to uh, to two governors slash procurators, uh, um, in, uh, in in the persons of uh, of Felix and Festus, and then here with a king. Not the king, as in Caesar, but I mean a, a king um, in that region there, um, King Agrippa, and so uh, you know just how God opened the door to allow Paul to speak to people of of high importance, just as it relates to government and things like that. Um, it's really it's really pretty pretty interesting, and it's and it's very it's it's I would imagine it's it's. When you when you think about the context of, under which all of this is going is is all this is going on under, you know, Paul is one who who presents himself pretty boldly, um, even even if it's under it is if it's in front of somebody who's important. I would imagine if you just take an average Joe today and you know set them before some high official in the United States government, whether you're talking about the president or or a well known senator or something like that. Um, you know, you, there are a lot of people who might be nervous, unsure of themselves, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, the apostle Paul, he knew his stuff. He, and as it, as it says, as again, we're going to get into this here in a little bit, but even here in, in the passage that we're going to look at, Paul acknowledges that, that, that he's doing all of this by the help of God. And, um, and so that's pretty amazing. So chapter 26 is the, is focused on, uh, Paul talking to Agrippa. Um, and to Felix, uh, excuse me, not Felix, but Festus, uh, because Agrippa has, uh, has, uh, come to visit Festus. Festus has said, Hey, I have this guy in my custody. Uh, the Jews are accusing him of all sorts of things. I see nothing, um, to, uh, to charge this guy with. It doesn't seem to be any wrong, anything wrong with this guy. And he is appealed to Caesar. Remember that's, uh, uh, that's what he did in the previous chapter in chapter 25, um, when he realized that he's not going to get anywhere um, with any of the people, whether with the Jews, obviously, or even with Festus. And so Paul says that I appeal to Caesar. So all the proceedings stop. And you know, the next opportunity that they have to send Paul to Rome to stand before the court in Rome, they're going to do that because Paul has has appealed uh, to Caesar. That's a right that he had um, as a Roman citizen. And so Festus is saying, I don't know what to write to Caesar or to the to the Roman court because I don't see anything wrong with the guy. And so Agrippa says, let me hear him. And so they bring Paul forward. And so we looked at the first part of of Paul's presentation to Agrippa. And like I said, we have to look at this um, in, with the understanding that this isn't only a defense uh, given by the Apostle Paul, but this is, as, we, as we're going to see by the end of this passage, uh, that this is an attempt for Paul to try and bring Agrippa and everybody else who's listening uh, to the faith. So Agrippa is there, Festus is there. You got military tribunals and and noble people from the community. So Paul has a, a wide audience here as he's talking about the uh, 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 talking about all of this. And so he goes into talking about what his hope is. His hope is, uh, and we talked about what that hope would be for any typical Jew, and, and Paul is no different from this, is that he has a hope in the Messiah and a hope in the resurrection. And it's just funny, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's, it's as if Paul is saying it's funny that I share the same hope of the resurrection as these, as these Jews, and yet it is because of my hope in the resurrection that I'm standing before you today. You know, you know, which Paul is saying that to kind of lay out the contradiction before them um, and saying this really doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, how Paul proceeds in all of this is to is to lay out um, how Jesus is the difference between what Paul believes as far as the hope of the resurrection and what everybody else as far as the unbelieving Jewish community believes. Because as I mentioned last time, Jesus Christ is that sticky point. And he's the difference between where Paul stands and where the where and where the Jews stand. They all have a hope in the resurrection, but Jesus is the one who guarantees 
that the resurrection is going to happen. And without him, there is no resurrection. And so it's Paul's embrace of, of Christ uh, that that is uh, that's the that's truly the difference here. What you ha- what you have to understand is that for many of these Jews and even all throughout Jerusalem and other places, the word by now has spread that Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, but that his disciples came and stole away the body. Remember that was that was the story that the uh, that the Jews told the Romans to tell um, when the empty tomb happened. And they knew for they knew they listen. They knew that Jesus was alive, but they didn't want that to get out. So they so they convinced the Romans to tell this lie. And Matthew, I believe it is, it says that that's the story that's been that's been told ever since. So you have a lot of people who still believe that that G, that Jesus Christ is dead. The reason why his tomb is empty is because the disciples came and stole away the body. So this whole thing of uh, of of. Even Jesus's resurrection is going to play in big here because Paul is going to be one who recognizes the difference between where he stands in the hope and where the other Jews stand in their hope. You know, the other people, the other Jews, you know, as far as Jesus goes, not so much. So Paul tells his testimony about how he was enthusiastically against this whole movement of Christianity. Of course, it wasn't called Christianity when he was doing all of these things, Um, but you know, he tells his testimony of who he was before he came to Christ. Then he tells the story of the Damascus Road, how the how he encounters. Now, listen, he encounters the risen Lord himself. So by telling that story, what he's saying is that, listen, Jesus Christ is the difference from where we stand. But listen, I can tell you from personal experience that Jesus Christ is alive because I saw him. I heard him. He talked to me and he gave me this commission to go and talk to the Jews and to the Gentiles. I am going to be a witness to all of this and to other things that he is going to reveal to me. And in the process, and, and again, this is a paraphrase here, um, in the process, there are going to be people who don't like it. So I'm going to deliver you from those people. But the idea here is that is that Paul is testifying to the fact that the risen Lord himself, who everybody would acknowledge did die, but Paul was one who's saying he is alive because I saw him and he gave me this commission. That's why I'm going and doing what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going out and I'm telling people about, about Christ. So that's an explanation of, of what he's doing and why he is saying the things that he's saying. Um, that's pretty important here. So the fact that, that Paul labels Jesus Christ as alive, and I think even behind that, I mean, just kind of connecting him to this whole thing of Jesus being the true Messiah um, you really begin to see Paul just kind of advancing in his in his presentation um, of the gospel to Agrippa and to um, everybody else uh, who was listening to this. You can see just, you know, just kind of the progression of, of what Paul is leading up to. Jesus Christ is alive. So that should tell you something. And if and if this Jesus Christ who was alive, if he's alive, if he was dead and he's alive. Don't you think that you should listen to him? Yes, Absolutely. And if I'm one who who encountered the risen Lord himself and he gave me this commission, I think that I have something to say about the whole matter. And so I think that's the angle that that Paul is is that Paul is coming to. Okay? So he is given um he's given his uh his uh his testimony as far as his encounter with uh, with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Okay. And if you, and again, I'm, this is just a review. If you want a fuller discussion of, of what we picked apart in that passage, um, from verses one through, uh, through 18, uh, then go and listen to that episode. That's part one of this discussion. And now part two, we're going to pick up in verse 19. So Paul is continuing, um, with this, with this presentation here. So he's finished talking about his testimony, uh, you know, about his, his encounter with, um, at the road uh, to Damascus. And so let me just start by reading a, 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 a collection of verses here. Let's start out by reading verses 19 through uh, 23. And in that, uh, in that passage, he says, Therefore, O King, o King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. 
but the Christ would must suffer and that uh, by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Now there is a lot there. Let's see what we can, let's see what we can come up with um, in all of this. It's really, it's really a, a pretty interesting. And right off the bat, you know, Paul is giving the reason as to why he goes around, why he has been going around and he's been saying the things that he's been saying as it relates to um, his ministry to, to the people, both to the Jews and to the, gent, uh, to the Gentiles. He, remember, he's just finished talking about how he encountered the ro- uh, Jesus on the road to Damascus and what Jesus told him. And just and just really to set it in our in our um, in our minds, let, let me go back to um, verse uh, 16. Um, you know, after Jesus identifies himself to Paul and saying that I'm the one that you're persecuting um, in verses 16 through 18, Jesus continued talking to Paul at that time, Saul, and says, but rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen, of which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So that, so you know, there Jesus, you know, is is commissioning Paul at that time and telling him what he is going to, what he's going to be doing all in the name of Jesus Christ. So when we pick up in verse 19, Paul's continuing when he's talking to Agrippa, he's saying, therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but, uh, but declared first to those in Damascus and then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn and turn to God uh, performing deeds in uh, performing deeds in keeping with repentance. Okay, so that was verses 19, 19 and twenty. So, given what has just happened on the Damascus Road, it's almost as if Paul is saying, "I, I have no other choice to be obedient. I wasn't I wasn't disobedient to the to the heavenly call. When heaven calls you and says this is what you are to do, especially in the way and in the manner that it happened to Paul at that time." you know, you're, you're going to do, you're, you're going to do what the Lord tells you to do. And so in that way, Paul is, is, is explaining and he's telling them, uh, he's telling Agrippa, he's telling Festus and everybody else who's in that court, this is why I've been doing what I've been doing. So if the Jews have a problem with what I'm doing and if the G- and the Jews have a problem with what I'm saying, you know, their, their beef isn't with me. <laughs> you know, their beef isn't with me. Their beef is with God himself. Okay. And really that's what it re- really, that's what it comes down to. If God really did in the form of Jesus Christ really did come down and encounter in, encounter Paul on the road. If people were to embrace that as true and believe that that is what happened, then what else, what else do you expect Paul to do? What else do you expect him to do? And what else do you expect him to say? You ca- You can't expect anything else from him. Because God spoke to him. God spoke to him, and that is what... Now, listen, I, 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 this is just coming to me because I think this is very important. Because for many Christians today, and especially in a time and in a, and in a place and in a, in a society like ours, there are, there are things from Scripture where if we talk about what Scripture actually says about A or B or C, it will definitely rub people the wrong way, Okay. And, um, it's important to know, it's important to know that when people object to what Christians believe, their beef isn't so much with Christians. Now it may come across as I have a problem with Christians and even in their own hearts and minds, they may convince themselves I have a problem with Christians, but really their beef, their, their main complaint is not against us. It's primarily against God. What we're doing, all we're doing is taking what God has said in his word and we're just telling people what God has said. Okay. And that's important to understand because it's, you know, when it comes to objections from different people, sometimes people will take that personally. You can't take it personally. 
I mean, maybe you can in some instances. Maybe they, they call you out by name and say you're, you're the scum of the earth. Nobody wants to be called names. Nobody wants to be excluded from things. And I know that some, and depending on who it comes from, whether it's somebody that was a friend before and now they've distanced themselves from you because of your stance in Christ and because of what you believe and because of what you say you believe, um, you know, if that happens, I understand that might, that might, uh, that might sting a little bit, but you have to understand that their main beef is with the Lord himself. And isn't that what Jesus actually said when he appeared to, uh, when he appeared to Paul on the Damascus road, remember what he said, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, was Jesus going around chasing a, 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 a Jesus bodily as he's going around and, and, and doing persecution? No, Jesus was up in heaven until he came and, and appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. What Paul had been doing is, is that he had been persecuting the Christians in Jerusalem and he was on his way to do so in Damascus. And so when Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus, he says, why are you persecuting me? Okay. Paul's main problem Although he probably wouldn't have obviously wouldn't have admitted it at the time in his pre-conversion days. But his main problem, his main beef was with God. So in a way, you know, it, it's somewhat in a different sense. But in a way, you know, Paul is 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 communicating the same thing. It's like, OK, if God came and appeared to me. I can't help but go and do what God has said. And so anything else, I mean, this is kind of the unsaid part, but I think the the idea behind it is that. You know, if the Jews have a problem, if anybody else has a problem, I can't help but be obedient to the heavenly call. And he says, I wasn't disobedient to that. And you can't expect me to be disobedient to that. So if the Jews have something against me, know that it's not so much against me, but it's against God himself. Because God has given me my orders and I'm not going to be disobedient about that. So he wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision, but as verse 20 says, but, uh, but declared first to those in Damascus and then in Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea. And remember, we saw that in, um, in, back in chapter 9. Um, it's interesting. He was stricken blind. And remember, he was led, back, uh, led to Damascus, the same place where he was going to persecute the Christians. When Ananias came and put his hands uh, on Saul's eyes and Saul's eyes, eyesight was restored, remember what we saw. Uh, Paul immediately started ministering to the people in Damascus. You know, so when he got started, he got started. He got started right away and he started right where he was at. And to the in the place where he intended to persecute Christians by bringing them back to Jerusalem and throwing them in prison. He is now um, alongside of, I would say, uh, many of the believers who are already in Damascus declaring Jesus Christ. And proving from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So he's there he, uh, in Jerusalem. He declared uh, to those in Jerusalem and then in Jerusalem. And remember, he came to Jerusalem because after a while, and we talked about this last time, a long period of time passed um, where there was a plot against against Saul's life. And so he escaped Damascus um, and he went to and he went to Jerusalem. OK, and so when he was in Jerusalem, as the, as that text says, he went in and out among them and he was, and he had been speaking to, um, the Hellenistic Jews there, the unbelieving Jews there, um, and declaring the Christ to them and they conspired against them. And so the brothers, uh, decided to smuggle, smuggle him out. And he eventually ended up in Cilicia, um, where he would minister there until Barnabas grabbed a hold of him to, to have him come back and help him with the church in Antioch. But so there it, it, he kind of lays it out there uh, first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles. And that's what we've been seeing pretty much through much of the latter part parts of, of Paul's missionary journeys. OK, all that whole territory that we've been covering pretty much, um, you know, you see you see him ministering to all sorts of people. I mean, uh, of, of Gentiles, uh, he would go to the Jews first, but you see him reaching out to the Gentiles as well. But if you look at, at Paul's missionary journeys from chapter 13 all the way through, you know, uh, pretty much chapter 21. You see how Paul ministers to, to Jews. He does still minister to Jews, but he also ministers to Gentiles as well, um, you know, just as he had been commissioned to do. Uh, by the Lord. Okay. And so he says, and also to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Now, I just want to pause just momentarily here for a minute, because one thing that I want us to do here, and I think I mentioned this last time, is that in the course of looking at this, um, 
let's pay attention to what it is that, I mean, just as Paul recounts what he did in his ministry, what it is that we as Christians, as we minister to other people, what we hope to see as a result of our ministry to other people. Specifically, when I'm, when I'm saying ministry to other people, I'm talking about gospel ministry, sharing the gospel. It doesn't necessarily have to involve a foreign missions work, and I, we talked about that before too, but even in just the personal one-on-one or small group ministries that you have when you try and reach out to other people. Obviously, what we want to see is what we want to we want to see people come to know the Lord. We want to see people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's the general perspective of what we, what we want to see. But Paul mentions, uh, you know, one of these things here that that he that he wants to see that he wished to see as people had repented and what he wanted to see thereafter. What we had seen before, what we wanted to see is that, and this goes back to uh, what we looked at last time in verse eighteen where he says that he was there to open their eyes. So, you know, to, that the blindness would be removed from people's eyes and that they would turn from darkness to light, right? That was the other thing. And from the power of Satan to God. And remember, we talked about that, that when somebody comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a transfer of kingdoms. It's a transfer of powers out of the power of Satan into the power of God. And that is a truly awesome transfer. Okay. You can't ask for anything better. And then as it says that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Okay, so you see you you see those sorts of things. That's what we want to see. That's that's the aim when we're ministering to people with the gospel. But here's another thing. What I just read there um, at the end of verse uh, of verse 20 there, uh, where it says that they should repent and turn to God. Okay performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Okay. Now we've talked about repentance before in times past. And let me just remind you again, what repentance is. Uh, Repentance is uh, from the original language in the Greek. It literally means a change of mind, Uh, you know, change of mind, a change of mind about yourself and who you are and how you are a sinner and a change of mind of who God is um, and uh, the person that you need to repent to. And all of that through faith in Jesus Christ. So repentance is a change of mind. And action-wise, it's a change of direction. Turning away from your sin and your sinful habits and going towards the person of Christ. That's what repentance is. Okay? And unfortunately, and I've mentioned this before, I don't think repentance is something that is that is stressed very much um, in our society today. It's more along the lines of make a decision for Christ, pray a prayer, that sort of thing. Those things don't really show up in scripture. What shows up in scripture is when people are, are ministering the gospel to other people, they make a call to those people saying that it is time for you to repent. And that was Paul's, that was Paul's ministry. That was, that was what Paul said in the midst of his ministry. Paul, just like Jesus, just like the disciples, just like John the Baptist preached repentance. Okay. Now, here's the thing. It, repentance isn't just something where, you know, uh, somebody says, I repent, and then, you know, they, they go about in their own way as they've always done before. And this is important for us to realize and, and, and to really realize as well, because, and, and again, we miss this um, if we don't really have a full grasp of the importance of, of repentance. Because here, um, Paul says uh, uh, there that, uh, that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds in keeping with their repentance okay in other words what that's saying is that you know showing you know performing deeds that are that are a proof that is a solid proof that repentance has actually taken place is basically what you have there somebody says says that i've repented but you look at their life you know and you get a good solid look as you observe their life as they as they live and you don't see any sort of difference you see somebody who looks the pretty much the same as they did uh, before they came to Christ. I think you would be in a very good position and people would be hesitant to do this, but I think you'd be in a good position to say this person really hasn't repented unto salvation, hasn't repented unto life. And I think that you would have be able to authoritatively say that based on what scripture says, not only here, but in other places as well. We don't have time to go into all of that. Um, but, uh, but that, but that was, that was a big part of Paul's ministry. In, in preaching the gospel, what he taught was repentance. And then for those, for those people who repented, we, what he wanted to see was a lifestyle that was in keeping with the repentance that had already taken place. Okay. And it doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that people stop sinning from now on. I mean, we're still sinful, imperfect people, but remember there's a change that has taken place. 
and this goes all the way back to when we talked about regeneration several weeks ago, what we ideally would see if somebody is truly genuinely saved and somebody who's really come to true genuine repentance in conjunction with the, with the, with the transformation, the regeneration that has taken place uh, at the point of, of salvation, you see a different pattern of life in that particular person. And you see somebody who is more in step with the things of God perfectly. No. Okay. I want to stress that. Okay. But you should see a difference there. And what you see there in somebody and walking in their life, they're, they're, they're living a life that is in keeping with the repentance that has already taken place. And so that's what Paul was after. Okay. So as he continues in verse 21, it says, for this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Now we get to the, to the actual beef that the Jews have with Paul. Now remember what they've been saying all along. You know, he speaks against the Jewish people. He speaks against the law of Moses. He, he speaks against the holy place. You know, they tried to pin him with this whole thing. If he tried to defile the temple by bringing a Gentile into here, all the, all this stuff. And so, you know, the Jews get very angry with him. They try and kill him. Even up to this point, it's been two, it's been at least two years where they're still trying to get rid of Paul and all of this stuff. Uh, you know, again, with things that aren't deserving of imprisonment or death or anything like that. Um, and nothing, obviously, we know that goes against anything that God has said in his word or in his scriptures or anything like that. Um, all, all the things that are behind that, and we shouldn't be surprised at this, but behind all of the objections that these Jews have, have had and that, have they, that they've made, which as we've been picking that apart, we've, be, we've been seeing how ridiculous those charges are. Behind all of that is the true heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is Paul's message of repentance. And you might even say that for many of these Jews who hear what Paul has to say, as stubborn as they are, for a lot of those people, they may have been hit with conviction, but they try and, 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 and hide that conviction by, by going after Paul even more, you know? So what basically what we're dealing with is we're dealing with a people who are, who are unwilling to, to repent of their sin and turn to God. And they are, and they dig their heels in believing that they are the ones who are in the right, that they are the ones who are walking in God's path. And listen, if you're talking to somebody who is saying to these other Jews that it's time to repent, that seems to imply to the Jewish audience that you believe that we're in the wrong. And how can you say that to people who are Jews who have been God's people for so many years? Okay. So, you know, the, the you would, you would see how the message of repentance would be, um, would be very, um, offensive to the people, to people like the Jews. And of course they can't present their, uh, their accusations. Uh, they can't, um, they can't present their objections in that way. So that's why you have this whole thing where they say, Oh, he tried to defile the temple and, and, and things like that. All the ridiculous things that, that are unfolded in this passage, Paul nails the heart of the matter right there in, in verse 21. And so he says, that's really the reason why they're after me. You know, they've been saying all of these things, but really what they find offensive is my, is my, uh, um, is my, uh, my, my, my message of repentance that I've been preaching. Okay. Now in verse 22, it says to this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great saying nothing, but what the prophets, uh, but the prophets and Moses said, would come to pass. No, what's this is interesting because it, the subtleties in this in this whole thing are, is, is pretty interesting. Just in in what he just said there in uh, in verse twenty two um, is very. T I mean, if there were any unbelieving Jews that would have been there, they're not any that are in this company listening to Paul. But if there were, you would imagine. I would imagine that some of them would either stand up and immediately object. Um, or, you know, if they, if they stayed silent, they would be stewing inwardly because just based, just by what he says there in verse 22, basically he's suggesting that I am in the right. And the reason why I know I'm in the right is because God is with me. He's been helping me through this thing all along. So that would imply that everybody else in the unbelieving circle of the Jews are wrong and God is not with them. You see how that would how that would how that would cause problems here. Now, of course, what Paul is saying is right. I mean, it's it would cause problems, but it's not because Paul is wrong. I mean, it's just it's just a matter of 
what the truth is and people wouldn't wouldn't like the truth but here but here you know he says to this day i have i have had the help that comes from god now listen he's had the help that's that comes from god even in this prolonged situation where he's been in chains and he's been in captivity this whole time remember he's been he's been in this predicament for two years okay and that all goes back to felix when felix wasn't willing to let paul go even though he knew that that uh um, that Paul was innocent, but yet how is how does how does God help Paul in this whole thing? In many different ways, but I but you, the way that Paul looks at this, you get a, a, another glimpse at the kind of perspective that he's had that he has. What Paul is going to do is he's going to draw from the commission that he that he got from the Lord Jesus Himself. You know, which pretty much in in a nutshell, saying go and and proclaim and be my witness both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And so Paul is saying God has been a help to me even up to this day from the beginning all the way up to this time so that, uh, you know, as it says here, as he continues to say um, there in that verse, uh, let me start again. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great. God has been a help so that even in this situation, even as a man in chains, God has been able to help him in carrying out his his mission. Okay. The fact that Paul is under arrest and the fact that Paul is in change, the fact that Paul is in captivity doesn't change anything about his mission, folks. Doesn't change anything. Now we've seen that before a couple of chapters ago in chapter 24. What is it that we see Paul doing with Felix one-on-one talking to him about the Christian faith, right? And as we're seeing right here, and as it's going to be made more evident, at least to Agrippa, we see that Paul is actually trying to do the same thing with Agrippa as well. And all of this by the by the hand of God, by the hand and the help of God. So he says, I've, I've been receiving this help from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but, now this, listen to this, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. Okay, so here we here we go where where Paul again, and he's done this before, where Paul is going to make the connection between what he's been saying, including everything that has to do with Jesus as the Christ. Remember, Jesus is that sticky point that many of the unbelieving Jews, the the hurdle that they can't they can't leap over. And Paul is saying all of this is in accordance with what is revealed in Scripture. Scripture being here, as he describes it, the prophets and Moses. What we would know, we you, we usually know that switched around, and now it's mentioned in other places in Scripture as Moses and the prophets. Okay, but all of that, whether, however way you say it, what he's what he's referring to is Old Testament Scripture. So Paul is saying that the Scriptures have have pointed forward to all of this, and it all has come to pass. And so he explains how it's been fulfilled in verse twenty three. He says that the Christ must suffer. And that being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to both our people and to the Gentiles. So isn't that actually what happened here? Isn't it true that the Christ, and notice it didn't say Jesus, he just said the Christ. So automatically, you know, you get Paul's understanding of who he saw Jesus as being. He understood that Jesus was the Christ. He was the Messiah. Everybody else wouldn't have. The unbelievers wouldn't look at Jesus as the Messiah. But he sees Jesus as the Messiah. He says that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead. Now, what does it mean here when he says that he's the first to rise from the dead? I think um, mainly what you're talking about here is at first as in preeminence. Um, I I believe and I I should have looked at the Greek to, to look this up. And I think the the proper word, if that is the case, would would be prototokos. Um, in the, I'll have to look that up, and if I remember, I'll I'll maybe mention it. But I mean, but but for but but taking the preeminence among everybody else who will be resurrected from the dead. So so listen, that is that is the reason why Jesus's resurrection in this whole thing is vitally important. Okay. And so, and so Paul is in this, uh, this whole thing is making a case for Jesus rising from the dead and the, therefore making a case for where he stands as far as it relates to the resurrection. Okay. So, you know, he says, he says that, that Christ is the first, he's, a, he's the preeminent. He's also, you could also say chronologically, he's the first to rise from the dead in a, in a glorified state. He's not the first to be risen from the dead bodily. I mean, just simply bodily. 
Um, you know, you'd see people like Lazarus, uh, the, the, the widow's son um, in Luke. Uh, you see other people, um, even in the ministry of Jesus, where Jesus raised people from the dead. Now, that's people being raised from the dead in still their old, decaying, broken down bodies. Okay. Jesus was the first, uh, was the prototype, the first, the firstborn, if you will, or uh, the fr rather first fruits, actually, um, to borrow the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, which serves as a guarantee of a resurrection to come, uh, to follow that, you know, that being the resurrection of people who are in him. Okay. And so he's the first in that sense. He's the first to be raised, glorified, right? And then when Christ comes back, we are to follow. You know, first those who are who have, who have dead, who have died and gone to sleep, and then those who are still on earth will be changed as well. And so that's that's what's going to happen there. So, at being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Okay. And so really when we're calling people out of darkness into light, there's a lot that goes into that. But in, in the context of what we're seeing here, I think one of the thing, big things that's included in that, that bringing people out of darkness into light is calling people into that area where they're sanctified. We talked about that a, a few verses before um, um, last time um, from last uh, episode when we were looking at verse 18, but also calling them into that hope, the true hope of repentance, uh, excuse me, of, of resurrection. Okay. The resurrection, I guess I should say the resurrection that, that, uh, that is unto eternal life. Because again, everybody will be risen from the dead. The question is, will, you, will they be risen to, unto eternal life or eternal condemnation? There's a distinction between the two. Jesus makes that distinction in John chapter 5. Okay. Um, okay, so we get to verse 24 here. Let's, let's read another section of, of verses here. Um, as this whole as this whole thing continues now in verse 24 it says and as he was saying these things in his defense festus said with a loud voice paul you are out of your mind your great learning is driving you out of your mind but paul said i am not out of my mind most excellent festus but i am speaking true and rational words for the king knows about these things and to him i speak boldly for i am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice for this has not been done in a corner king agrippa do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, "In a short time, would you in a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian?" And Paul said, "Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains." Okay. So again, a lot there. Let's see what let's see what we can come up with. Now, when we get into verse uh, verse twenty four, Paul is interrupted. By Festus, okay. Now remember, somebody like Festus and and other people who are Gentiles and, and things like that. That their whole perspective about resurrection is that it doesn't happen. Um, now, of course, you did have Jews in the form of the Sadducees who would say the same thing. But I mean, most and most of the Jewish community people believed in the resurrection, in different philosophical and religious ideas and beliefs within the Roman world and the Greco-Roman world. Resurrection just was just not a thing. Resurrection from the dead. And so Paul talking about all this and more specifically talking about the resurrection of Christ, because he said that um, that he was the uh, as he said there, that he was the first uh, to arise from the dead. That that catches Festus, um, you know, Festus's attention. And so as it says there in verse 24, he says, and he was saying the, as he was sa and as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Uh, you know, that's it, it, it. I almost look at that as as um, as Festus saying, like, look, you you are too educated, so educated to the point that you're not making any sense. In a way, I kind of maybe understand what he's trying to say when he says that. You know, some have you ever talked to somebody um, uh, from a from a scriptural perspective who is really, really, I mean, really doctrinally smart. But their but their education, their academic way of going about them is is to such a high level that they start looking at things so deeply that it, it loses all of its relevance. And they start saying all sorts of things that just sound weird, probably because it is weird, or probably because they're overthinking something because they're just they're just mind their minds just work that way. 
and they're just like, what are you talking about? You know, I've been, I've been in that situation before and they dig, dig, dig it. Like in, 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 it's, it's nothing wrong with digging in scripture. You, you, you know, me, uh, by now, you know, that, that, that there's, I would say there's nothing wrong with that, but it can go overboard with some people to the point where people are saying certain things about scripture. And it's just so deep and minute and things like that. I just look at them like, look, you if you keep doing this, you're going to lose the meaning and the relevancy of what the passage is actually saying. And so some of the things that they actually are saying, I just say, who cares? Who gives a flip? But yeah, I mean, it, you've lost me now, okay? <laughs> you know, in, in, in some way, maybe not in an exact way, but in some way, that's kind of, I think that's kind of the feeling that, that Festus has. Now, of course, he has, he kind of has a bias behind this, uh, behind all of this, because he is, he is not one who embraces this whole thing of resurrection of the believer or Jesus Christ or otherwise. Okay. And so that's, that's what he says about Paul. He says, Paul, you've lost your mind. You've, you're educated to a point where it's, it's driven you insane. Now listen to, listen to Paul, uh, Paul's answer in verses 25 and following. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. Now notice, Paul wasn't one who took offense by this. He wasn't one who said, how could you say that? How dare you? That's offensive. I know that there would probably be a lot of Christians who in, in this same spot who would probably react that like that. Which, I mean, uh, to which I would say, look, you got to grow up out of stuff like that. I mean, really, there are more there are more important things than just being wounded by, you know, by your pride. Oh, you said I'm out of my mind. Well, yeah, but that kind of comes with the territory. Paul was one. It didn't phase him. And he, and he still uh, uh, spoke to Festus with a large me- measure of respect when he says, oh, ex- uh, most excellent Festus. You know, the standard way of talking to a high official, even though this official says you're you're out of your mind, you've lost it. You know, he says, I, you know, I haven't lost my mind. Um, uh, most excellent Festus. Now, let's listen to what he goes on to say. But I am speaking true and rational words. Why? How can how can you make that conclusion, Paul, that you're speaking true and rational words? Verse 26, for the king knows about these things and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. In other words, Paul is not the first and only person to be speaking the things that he has been speaking. I mean, especially when it comes to things like the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Is Paul the only person in the world who has been preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that he is alive? No. So many other people who are, who, are, who are in Christ at that time have been saying the same thing. It's a very central message to, message in the Christian gospel. So if people, other people are preaching the gospel, you have to understand that people would be saying and declaring the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. You know, now granted, not everybody believes that in the unbelieving world. Again, they go, they go by, the, by the whole belief that, that Jesus, uh, Jesus is still dead and his body was stolen. Okay, but... But for those who believe, they are ones who declare that, yes, Jesus Christ is alive. That's what Peter said from the very beginning. And, and Pentecost was one of the things that he that he majored on. He majored on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. So this has all been out in the open. And so that's what Paul means, you know, when, it, when he says, um, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for... Uh, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. This has all been done publicly. For people who know what Christians speak about, what they talk about, what they preach about, they know that they speak about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now, when you get into verse 27, now Paul turns his direction back to Agrippa. Now now watch what he does. In verse 27, he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Now, in some way, this could be, you know, in a milder sense or maybe in an indirect sense, this could be um, an attempt, (laughs) an attempt of some sort to make Festus look a little bit foolish. Because, listen, Paul already knows. And he just said, so right there, I know that you believe in the law and the prophets. And if Agrippa answers yes to that, you know, what does that say about uh, what does that say to Festus? Because Festus has been hearing what Paul has said. And how Paul is connecting these things to the law and the prophets. And Festus is saying, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. You're insane. And so if Paul says, hey, D- King Agrippa, the, the, you know, you, 
you believe in the law and the prophets, don't you? And if Agrippa says yes, I would imagine that uh, maybe Festus would, would kind of be red-faced in embarrassment because then it would be like, I just, you know, if Agrippa believe, believes this, then, um, you know, I just called the king crazy and out of his mind for believing something like this, you know. But here's, here's really the, the, the primary thing I think that, that Paul is, is getting to. Again, Paul has, has, has made the connection here that everything that he's been saying about Christ and, and, the, and the things that come after him have been foretold in the law and the prophets and Moses and the prophets. Okay, so that some, for people who really do know scripture, so people who know, not only know, but believe the law and the prophets, who believe Moses and the prophets, it would be hard for them to the, escape the reality that what the Moses and the prophets has said is actually has come to pass in the person of Jesus Christ. And the whole thing of everything that's happened with Jesus Christ is not, is not unknown because as Paul says, this hasn't been done in a corner. So Agrippa knows the law and the prophets. He knows what's been going on with Jesus and the whole proclamation of him being raised from the dead. And so now with Paul, after making this connection, he turns it straight to straight to Agrippa and he says, well, King, what say you? Do you believe that? Do you believe in the prophets? I know that you do. do. I know that you do. So it's really a, an interesting situation that Agrippa is in. Because if he says, yes, I believe in that, then he instantly loses respect, I think, from a lot of his Roman colleagues. Because that would be him admitting that he believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and believed in the resurrection of any sort, which would make him look foolish. If to save face with everybody else and to keep himself from making himself accountable to repentance unto God. And he says, no, I don't believe uh, in, um, in the prophets. Then uh, the next going to rub the Jews the wrong way as well. Um, you know, but even in this, what Paul is trying to do, though, what he's trying to do, is he's trying to, he's really going back to even verse 18 to, to open their eyes. You know, Paul is trying to, to have Agrippa open his eyes to the reality of what's been presented before him. It's a hard thing to bury the reality that the, that the prophets are in line with everything that he, you know, Paul, that Paul has been saying about Jesus Christ. And so now he puts it in, in King Agrippa's court and says, do you, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. And this was Paul's way of, bring, of, of bringing Agrippa to that point where he would see his need for Christ when he puts two and two together and everything like that. And that's where, that's where the whole idea of, of Paul using this as an opportunity to reach Agrippa with the gospel. Now, the thing is, and what we have to understand is that the sinful heart is resistant to God and to the things of God, to Christ and to the gospel. That's nothing new. We know, we know that. And we see the same thing here. Agrippa doesn't answer directly. He kind of sidesteps the question. And so when he, in, in verse 28, so he says, and Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? He's like, he's saying like, are you really trying to do this to me right now? And you think that by just what you said here in this short amount of time that you're able to convince me of the reality of this and that I need to become a Christian just like you? You think that that's something that you, you really were able to do? Are you trying to do that to me? You know, you, know, you would sense maybe in, in some sense that maybe he maybe and I'm not I'm, I'm not I don't know for this for sure. But in some way, maybe he's saying this in somewhat of a intimidating tone. Do you honestly think, mister, that you're going to that you're going to turn me into a Christian in such a short amount of time? And Paul, listen, Paul's not going to dance around the issue. Afraid of 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 offending the king, saying, oh, no, 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 what you know, I, I'm, I'm really just trying to get you to think about these, blah, 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 you know, that sort of thing. Paul doesn't dance around that issue. He admits it straight out in his answer to, to Agrippa's question. It says, and Paul said, whether short, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who, all who hear me this day might become such as I am. That is a believer in Christ, a Christian, except for these chains, except for these chains. In other words, I wish you would be 
people who were Christians like I am that you would be saved. Don't wish persecution upon you or anything like that, like it, like it is with me as I am in these chains. But I do wish that all of you would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul just straight out admits it. He says, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. Can't keep your message, uh, your mission secret. You got to be open about things like that. Paul was here. You know, Agrippa was on to him. And, uh, you know, not afraid of having offended Agrippa or anything like that. Paul said, yeah, that's, yeah, you, you, you hit it on the head. That's exactly what I was trying to do. And not only with you, but everybody else in this room. And I hope that all of you would become Christians, except, except, uh, except for these chains. Truly an amazing thing. Now, just as the proceedings close, and we, and we see this in the last few verses here um, of the chapter as we, as we close this out, it says in verse 30 and following, it says, Then the king rose, and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had, and when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Okay. Now, the main thing that I want to draw out from there, um, again, let, let's uh, consider even when you look at verse 31, it says this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. That's what we've been seeing this whole time. People outside of that unbelieving Jewish circle, they've, they've looked at this and they said, this guy hasn't done anything to warrant the position that he's been in. He doesn't deserve death. He doesn't deserve imprisonment. So listen, Felix has come to that conclusion, Festus, and even here Agrippa. Now, what's the right thing to do? What is the right thing to do in this situation? Paul, you are free to go. You're free. Go forth from my presence and you are a free man now. That would be the right thing to do. Unfortunately, that's not, well, unfortunately, it depends on the perspective that you look at it because this is the way that God has set for, for Paul to, to, get to, Ro- uh, to get to Rome. But from a, from a purely judicial standpoint, it's unfortunate that we see Agrippa do what he does because he, he says here, and Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Almost as if he's saying that once you appeal to Caesar, you're locked in to your decision. And even though we see nothing wrong with you, it's, it's too late. You, you appealed to Caesar, so we have to send you to Caesar. That's not how it worked. Agrippa could have easily said, look, I, you know, we need to let this person go. But instead, he says, well, I mean, if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, you know, he would have been let go, which I don't believe is true, by the way. Paul knew what was going on. He, he appealed to Caesar for a reason. Because he saw right through what Festus was trying to do in, in granting the Jews a favor. So he knew he wasn't going to get anywhere with Festus and he wasn't going to get anywhere with the Jews, obviously. So this is a miscalculation just as far as how Agrippa is reading things, I think, where he says that he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. I don't think that's necessarily accurate. But the, but the point is, though, is that Agrippa knows the right thing to do. He, it is within his power to let Paul go. And that doesn't happen. And so the, the whole thing of, of Paul being sent to, uh, sent to Rome uh, will proceed. And so that's where we see all that we see in chapter 27 with this um, harrowing adventure on the Mediterranean Sea that we're going to see. It's going to take us a couple of weeks to, to, to get through that. And we'll, we'll try and point out as we go through all, of the, all those things and work out all the details as, as, there, as there a narrative of, of all the nautical things that, that happen, uh, we're going to we're going to try as best as we can to see how God works even in that, and even what God's purpose was for Paul on that boat. Okay, and so that's what we're going to what we're going to try and draw from that as we as we read the the narrative of that. Okay, so now again that's going to be in in a, in a couple of weeks uh, in a couple of weeks. Okay, because we're keep taking uh, another break uh, for a couple of episodes. The last break that we're going to take is we're looking at the Book of Acts. Okay, so. Prepare your hearts and prepare your minds for what we're going to look at next time, just as I said at the beginning of the episode um, on the topic of, of restoring a, a brother or sister in Christ who's in sin. Um, again, a very important topic that Jesus addresses here. 
um, as you know, it was, uh, specifically in in the passage of Matthew chapter 18. So I would encourage you to come back um, and uh, and uh, and join us in the examination of Scripture um, as we look at that. So, but as for now, we're going to leave it here. We finished chapter 26. Okay, so just two more chapters to go in the in the book of Acts, and then we'll be finished with that. Okay, so if you like this show, um, and uh, maybe you've come upon loving the scriptures for the first time, and you like what you hear, um, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts, um, also on Google Play. You can also check out Loving the Scriptures on Twitter. I handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S E R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. All right, I think a good discussion and examination of scripture. I've enjoyed my time as always. Um, I hope you have as well. My name is Steve Gill, and I hope to see you right back here next time. Bye now.